Welcome in Hokies fans to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast as we record on Wednesday, October 20th. Virginia Tech looking to rebound from last week's loss to Pitt with a game against the Syracuse Orange finishing off a three-game homestand in Lane Stadium. On episode 201 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, we're going to go through the Orange and their star running back Sean Tucker who is putting up unreal numbers through the first seven games and how the Hokies can bounce back and try and get a win heading into that final third of the season. Most of those games coming on the road. All of that and more coming up on episode 201 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, which starts right now. We welcome you in, whether you are listening archived on Apple Music, Apple Music, Amazon Podcasts, whatever, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you are watching live on YouTube, make sure you ask some questions for Chris, who is on set today, and Katie will get to those at the end of the show. As always, the Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. You can help bring Olympic hopeful wrestlers to Blacksburg with one of the fastest growing and best wrestling programs in the country. Go to southeastrtc.com to learn more and donate today. We have a different crew on set today. We have our usual Chris Coleman in, to my left, the lead analyst and columnist at TechSideline.com. Behind the scenes, Malcolm Stewart, the best podcast producer in the land. And in the fourth chair, Katie Adams, as always on Wednesdays, is here. She'll have her trivia, her notes, her stats at the midway point and answer your YouTube questions in, at the end of the show. And I'm back as your host after not being here on Monday, Jake Lyman. And we have our newcomer on set, our resident Syracuse ep- expert making his debut on the Tech Sideline podcast, Giovanni Heater, a freshman in our sports media program at Virginia Tech. Introduce yourself, Gio. Uh, just super grateful to be here. Uh, can't thank you guys enough for having me and uh, super excited to talk SU football and Virginia Tech football. And uh, I, I listen every week, so it's, it's a little bit of a dream come true to be on the set today. I'm excited. This was a great recruiting job by Bill Roth. <laughs> Gio, from Syracuse, New York. Yes. shows Virginia Tech's communications department over Syracuse, which is noted as one of the absolute best in the country. So this is kind of like going into Tuscaloosa, Alabama and stealing a five-star running back from from Nick Saban. Yes, you can see uh, if you're watching on the YouTube uh, behind Geo, we have an orange heat shirt uh, from his podcast and show that he did back in high school covering Syracuse sports. So grew up a diehard Syracuse fan, but he's down in Blacksburg uh, pursuing sports media. So Yeah, that was a cool surprise. I didn't know Will ever got one of those shirts way back when, so that's super cool. Well, as you can see, I'm a little rusty after a week off of the podcast. I couldn't say the words Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music, but we are good to go here on episode 201 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We went through the pit loss on Monday. We're going to talk about Syracuse today, Hokies and the Orange 1230 kick from Lane Stadium on Saturday afternoon. This is a game the Hokies, it feels like they have to win if they want to get this season back on track. You know, they've lost three home. If they lose, it will be three home losses in a row. And then you're staring down the gauntlet of four road games in, in their la- out of their last five. Um, and I'm not even, but although to be honest, I'm not sure that makes a huge difference anymore. Tech is 16 and 18 at home against Power Five teams since 2014. I think so. I'm not so sure. I wouldn't rather play road games. Yeah. At this point. So, well, well, I mean, but but at the same time, I mean, if you think about it, I, that's a lot of travel within a five week span. Yes, and and it's not and it's a tra- it's a trip to Miami and it's a trip to Boston, which is like the two furthest places you can go, and that's within six days because right. that BC game's on a Friday night. That's so, a lot of airline miles. It is, and then back down to Miami a few weeks uh-huh. later. So uh, definitely a lot of flying around for the Hokies. And we when we talked about it after what, the West Virginia game, that was the Hokies' first road game, and we talked about you've got Richmond, then a bye, then Notre Dame, then Pitt, then Syracuse, all at home. You don't have to travel for six weeks almost. It kind of felt like a good thing, but then you barely beat Richmond, you lose yeah. two in a row, and now Syracuse you, you coming to, in. Yeah, when you reach this point and you've got all these road games, you need to be better than three and three. Um, it'll be interesting. You know, the, the, the home crowds, for the big games at least, have been really, really good and really boisterous, and Tech's only road game was in a really good atmosphere uh, against West Virginia, but you know, 
uh, we're getting putting the card before the horse here, I guess. But uh, how will they respond when they play in front of kind of sleepy crowds against yeah. Georgia Tech and Boston College and and even Miami, um, where yeah. they're really struggling to put people in that stadium these days. But we got a home, one more home game before we get to that point. Yep, two home games left for the Hokies on the schedule, Syracuse and Duke. I want to go to Geo here just to talk about the Orange. You obviously follow them pretty closely. It's been kind of a strange season for Syracuse. It felt like they were going to be in the cellar of the ACC at the beginning of the year, but they've been competitive, three and four, and three of those four losses have been by a field goal, Florida State, Wake Forest, and Clemson. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Syracuse really, it, it's they're losing – but their trajectory is going like this, right? You started the season with these question marks at the quarterback position, and they took a little bit to figure that out. They started the season with Tommy DeVito. Now he leaves for the transfer porter, portal, and I think in a way it's a good thing for the team because they have that question mark out of the way. They also lose Taj Harris, uh, one of Syracuse's leading wide receivers for the last handful of years. But the trajectory is going like this, and the biggest part is they're figuring things out offensively, right? The defense was always good, uh, but they've consistently gotten a little bit better each week. You know, Florida State was Garrett Schrader's first game where everyone was like, okay, okay, this this is our quarterback. We can see what he can do. He re had a lot of really good runs in that game. Now they're starting to throw in the passing game a little bit, and Sean Tucker has been absolutely lights out. The guy had 130 yards in the first half against Clemson, and now uh, in the second half of that one, Brent Venables was able to kind of slow him down a little bit still ended off uh, with I think 154 yards uh, but he's a huge asset to have then you have a quarterback that can run um, but defensively is where Syracuse's strongest suit seems to be I mean these guys can make a lot of stops the secondary is very very good and they continue to recruit that uh, cornerback safety position really really well I think uh, the new defense that they brought in um, has really helped because they're adding that extra uh, rover position an extra defensive back in there uh, and they're only rushing three pass rushers on the defensive line so it makes that defense a little bit more athletic and a little tougher to play against I think it's really impressive what he's done this year Dino Babers I mean considering the experience level of this team you look at their key players on offense you've got uh, Garrett Schrader who's a sophomore um, you've got running back Sean Tucker who's a freshman and they start a redshirt freshman at one wide receiver spot a redshirt sophomore at another wide receiver spot they're a true freshman in the two deep at wide receiver and I'm just going to go up and down all their linebackers and all their defensive backs on the two deep and give you their ages. True freshman, true freshman, true sophomore, true freshman, true freshman, true sophomore, redshirt freshman, redshirt freshman, redshirt junior, true freshman, true freshman, true freshman, true sophomore, redshirt freshman, true freshman, redshirt freshman. How in the world have those guys been able to stop anybody this year with, with that much youth on defense, yet they've been able to do it? Uh, um, so it really seems like to me that uh, they're close. Like next year, Syracuse has a chance to be a good team next year. I mean, I, and they're close to being a good team this year. The wild thing is for me about this team um, and in comparison to Virginia Tech and is that I don't think there's a single position group that Virginia Tech beats Syracuse besides wide receiver. I think uh, between Robinson and Trey Turner, without a doubt, Virginia Tech's wide receivers are better. But besides that, like, I don't know where they beat Syracuse. Maybe quarterback, you know, Gra Braxton Burmeister and Garrett Schrader, a little bit of a toss-up. Personally, Schrader with a 6'4 frame, a guy that can kind of barrel through you. You know, Braxton's incredibly fast, but he's playing a little bit banged up. And it takes one guy to tackle Braxton, where Schrader, it takes a couple of guys, and he's fast, and he can make you miss. Um, but you look at the linebacker spot. Syracuse has depth. I mean, Michael Jones is in there. Jeff Canton, our coup. I mean, they have a lot of depth at the linebacker spot. Talented guys that have put up big numbers. And once you look past... Um, you know, Virginia Tech with Dax Holifield, I think Syracuse beats him at that position. You look in the secondary, especially um, if some guys are banged up in the secondary uh, for Virginia Tech. Waller. For Waller, sure. exactly. Yeah. Like, if Waller doesn't play on Saturday, I think Syracuse has him beat without a doubt. Deuce Chestnut, a true freshman, a four-star guy. That's one of Syracuse's biggest recruits in a long time. So I just struggle to see, obviously, the running back position. You know, 130 yards in the first half for Sean Tucker against Clemson. Yeah, I'm not sure Jalen have had 130 yards all year. <laughs> yeah, Jalen Holston has 147 rushing yards the entire season, right? right? So uh -huh. when you just look at that, it's crazy to think because Virginia Tech, recruiting-wise, has the bigger caliber guys. But I don't know where they beat Syracuse position to position uh, comparing the two. Punter. That, that's true. <laughs> we'll give Peter Moore the edge there. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Sean Tucker. That's, I think, where you have to start with Syracuse. I mean – 
as a true a COVID freshman. So mm-hmm. he's been yes. there for two years, but listed as a true freshman, he has eleven hundred and seventy two total scrimmage yards through seven games, eleven touchdowns. He was the first running back since Reggie Bush's Heisman season to have 750 rushing yards, 200 receiving yards, and 10 touchdowns through the first six games of the season. I mean, this dude is unbelievable as in his first real experience playing. You know, uh, his second in the country in yards per game, I believe. And the guy who's first in the country um, is uh, Walker at Michigan State. Right, right. And he was at Wake Forest uh, for his first two years and then transferred to Michigan State. So it's funny that the top two – Running backs in the country right now were were originally recruited by Wake Forest and by Syracuse. Yeah. And I, actually, I'm doing an exercise for my Inside the Numbers column today, so I'm going over the top ten running backs in the country in yards per game from Power 5 schools because I want to put guys in there who play similar schedules. And it's funny how the vast majority of those guys were not highly re- recruited guys out of high school. There's one five-star guy in there and I think two four-star guys, and everything else was three-star. And, and even you know Walker at Michigan State – he was a two-star. He was like the number 112 player in the state of Tennessee coming out of high school. It's uh, it, it's funny, like, evaluation and player development and all this stuff's really important. I know people see recruiting stars, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're more important things. Um, and when you can uh, – when, you know, Syracuse can find a three-star running back from the state of Maryland, you sit here and think, surely Virginia Tech evaluated him at some point just being a regional guy. Yep. And and he only had two other offers like Rutgers and Wisconsin and you know who, to me if, if if Wisconsin offers a running back from your region you should automatically offer that running back right just with their history of putting top running backs in the NFL and and just being historically good at evaluating players at that spot but uh, certainly an impressive one-two punch on the ground with Tucker and Schrader Schrader has. He's basically started for one full season now. He started for maybe a half a year at, at Mississippi State and then transferred to Syracuse where he started, what, three games? Yeah, I mean, we started with Tommy DeVito, and then they sprinkled him in after a couple of weeks, and then Schrader kind of got the the thumbs up uh, to go ahead and was the starter. And then at that point, I mean, they didn't look back. And he's completely changed the offense too because – now they are implementing complete like they're just running it differently, right? They're they're running it at a faster pace. They're mm-hmm. not dropping him back to pass as much. But the biggest thing is his escapability. Mm-hmm. Like because the offensive line for Syracuse really good in run blocking, but they they struggle in pass blocking, right? Schrader's a guy that can get away from pressure and make a play uh, using his legs with improvisation, and he can make guys miss and he can run through guys. Tommy DeVito didn't have that, no. right? And and that has added a completely different dimension to this football team. Yeah, and I saw his long touchdown run against Florida State was actually a rollout pass, and yeah. he just pulled it down and kept it, and he ran through tackles, and then he outran the Florida State defense. So he's he's six four two thirty, so you didn't expect somebody that big to be as fast, but he outran the Florida State defense on that play, and I believe he has seven career starts and over one thousand rushing yards. So. This dude's no joke. I mean, he's probably the the best running quarterback Tech will face this year. I'll uh, just off the top of my head. The tough thing, though, you know, for this game for Syracuse offensively is like they struggle to pass the football. Yes, and, and like Schrader, like Tommy DeVito was a better sound passer than Garrett Schrader. 10 times out of 10. No doubt. But the problem with that is they never supported him with a good offensive line, and they never supported him with a strong receiving core. So mm-hmm. a guy like that, it just didn't play to his strengths. Right. Syracuse needs a guy like Schrader, a guy that can run it. Schrader has some big similarities to Eric Dungey when it comes to size, ability to run, and his heart. I mean, this guy, you don't like to see him put his body on the line. It makes you hold your breath when he's running with the football, but he does that, right? Sure. And he, guys respect that. Guys want to play for that. Uh, but Syracuse throwing the football – Receivers make a lot of drops. Then you lose Taj Harris, who was also undersized and known for dropping the football too. So it's not a huge loss for Syracuse because he had two catches for 20 yards the entire year. And that's why he said, all right, I'm done. Like, you guys aren't even throwing me the football and left. But um, guys aren't making plays for Schrader. Schrader doesn't make the best decisions throwing the ball through a really bad pick against Clemson. So throwing the ball at Virginia Tech can make Syracuse throw it in the 20, 30-yard range. That's where Syracuse can run into trouble. You know, right. they can stop the run like Clemson did. That's when it gets a little hazy. But the last couple of weeks, the passing game has gotten consistently better week to week. It's, it's sort of like uh, Hendon Hooker's best games at Virginia Tech were when he only had to throw the ball 10, 15, 16, 17 times, something like that. Now, if you ask him to drop back and throw it 25 or 30 times, 
uh, it was generally because Tech was losing and they were in long yardage situations and they couldn't run the football, and that's when he was really ineffective. And Schrader is going to be a lot more effective when they can run like play action on second and three rather than, oh, we stopped their running game on the first two downs and now it's third and 12. Right. Right. So if Virginia Tech can stop the Syracuse running game, then it would be very, very difficult for Syracuse to win the football game because they'd have to move the ball in chunks down the field through through the passing game, which they have not been able to, to do this season. But, you know, the tough part about it is, you know, Syracuse is so good running the football, and that's the weakness of Virginia Tech's defense. Yeah. Um, they have really struggled to stop the run the last three weeks. Even against Richmond, they didn't do a, a good job against the run. And the running game is Pitt's weakness. Pitt, Pitt has not been able to run the ball well this year until they played Virginia Tech last week. So – that makes you worry big time that, like, yeah, Syracuse can't pass, but is that even going to matter? Right. Well, the Hokies should be able to key in on that run. You look at Schrader's stats, 54% completion percentage, under seven yards per attempt. And I look at their wide receiving core, and there's just not a lot of good options there. Uh, Taj Harris, you mentioned, transferred out. Yep. Uh, their top four receivers outside of Taj Harris and obviously Sean Tucker, who leads the Orange in receiving, have combined for less receiving yards than Tavion Robinson and Trey Turner. So yeah. definitely not a lot of options in the receiving game. If the Hokies can do what they do outside, even without Jermaine Waller, mm -hmm. it seems like you can load up that box and try and stop Sean Tucker. On it the seems ground. like if, if there's going to be a week to load the box and really put everybody in the secondary on an island, that this would be it. And if they can beat you down the field passing that way, then you tip your cap. But but we'll see. We, we, we really haven't seen that out of Virginia Tech this year against any opponent. But there hasn't been an opponent on the schedule like this as far as that they're so run heavy. The thing that um, is interesting, too, with this matchup for Syracuse is, you know, nobody really knew how to stop Sean Tucker up to this point. And not that Clemson stopped him. He had 130 yards in the first half. But then in the second half, what did he have, 24 more yeah, yards on top of that? 27 yards on the ground. 27 yards on top of that. So the one thing is last week, if there was a blueprint made to stop <laughs> Sean Tucker, I think Brent Venables just wrote it up. So if yeah. I'm Virginia Tech this week um, and Jay Ham, I'm looking at what Clemson did to stop Sean Tucker in the second half. The other thing, though, is Sean Tucker is not just a threat running the ball up the middle. He's mm. also a threat in the receiving game. Yep. I mean, he he has um, a couple of receiving touchdowns, and he has a lot of receiving yards as well. So he's a threat both ways. And I'd say he's their best receiver. He's their leading receiver um, as far as numbers go. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he can run the ball. He can catch the football. And he, he's so dangerous in space. He's just fun to watch. And his story is crazy, too, because – um, you know, you, we might look at a guy that didn't even have an opportunity. Uh, he was the third back last year. Um, you had uh, ahead of him um, Abdul Adams, who was the transfer from Oklahoma, and Jarvian Howard, um, who was kind of a promising guy for Syracuse. And then they both opted out with the COVID season, decided not to play and sit out. That made Sean Tucker, as a true freshman, become the starting back. Nobody expected anything out of this kid. And then last year he had a great year, and everyone wondered, could he keep it up this year? Um, won the starting job over Adams um, and Jarvie and Howard coming in this year. And, I mean, he has just absolutely torn it up to the point where Abdul Adams is still on the team, but Jarvie and Howard decided to transfer out. And uh, just a lot of unexpected things. And now, you know, I don't know if Virginia Tech fans know, but 44 is a really big deal in Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> Ernie Davis, Jim Brown, Floyd Little, I mean, it is the historic – and they're literally talking about bringing it out of retirement and giving it to Sean Tucker because nobody's had a season like this in a very, very long time for Syracuse. And he's having a Heisman-worthy season like Reggie Bush in 2005 that if Syracuse was winning more than three games, yeah. he'd literally be a Heisman contender. Well, the 44 I remember when I was a kid was Rob Conrad. Yep. Well, and he he's was the he was last the, one to wear. Is he really? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he the was last the last one to do it justice, I should say. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. And he played for a long time in the NFL with the Dolphins, I think. Yep. Um, yeah. So Abdul Thomas is their number, or excuse me, Abdul Adams is their number two running back. Yet you don't see him on their top rushers list right here because I think he only has like 24 carries or something like that on the year. Like yeah. all you're, you're just going to see just a, a hammering of number 16 and number 34. On and Saturday. that's the fear. Yeah. Like, you don't want to overwork him. There's been right. a couple of times where Syracuse fans are, you know, don't give it to him. You don't want to rush him 40 times a game and get the kid hurt. You know right. what I mean? So. Right. And, th th and this is the sort of the sad part in college football these days. Like, there's so much tampering. And, and you can tamper with, with recruits and players and things like that on social media these days. And nobody, the NCAA will never know about it. You know there are people in his DMs right now on Twitter 
coaches from other schools saying, don't stay at Syracuse. Yeah. You're never going to win there. You can transfer here and win championships. Right. Or, you know. Right. And, and, and that, that's just the nature of the beast in college sports these days. Well, I do love Sean Tucker. When you were mentioning his story and social media, I want to put them together. His <laughs> tweets after games. He's hilarious on, on Twitter. He'll tweet out his stat line. It's like, on Saturday again, or on Friday against Clemson, I ran for 157 yards, but was very disappointed that we didn't get the win. Hopefully next week we'll, we'll, we'll pull out the win or something like that. Like, it, it's very uh, wholesome from a, a college athlete to put that out there. I'm but pretty, he does include his own stats. He does. Right. He does. <laughs> I'm pretty convinced that, I mean, it could be a him thing, but a lot of people think, like, it might be his dad. It might be right. something along those lines. Um, Dino Babers said, you know, there's not a like that's why a lot of people want to give him the 44 too. Like he's deserving it on the field, but like as a person, he's as humble as it gets as a right. player. Like yes, he's putting out his stats, but um, it's not from that like mindset. You know, he's very very quiet. Doesn't like to talk. Doesn't like the press conferences and stuff. Even though they kind of force him to do it. Um, and Dino Baber said he's a guy that's so quiet that he doesn't have to tell you that he's good. He just plays well on the field, and he doesn't like to talk about it, and he's pretty much as humble as you see a college athlete these days. So, Well, for Syracuse, I think Dino Babers was, even at the beginning of the season, probably in a, a hotter seat than Justin Fuente. When we talked about the coaches on the hot seat at the beginning of the year, he was one of them. He may have lifted himself off that so far. Mm -hmm. Again, we mentioned three and four, but... Lost by a field goal each of the last three times they played. Yes. Florida State, Wake Forest, and Clemson. With freshmen. So many freshmen. And and Wake Forest looks like they could win the, the Atlantic. Clemson obviously not having the season they're expected to, but they're still the Clemson Tigers with all that talent. Uh, Florida State has looked better over the last couple of weeks. So this is a team that is competitive with talented teams. I, I think at the beginning of the year, when you looked at the Hokies' schedule, you thought, Syracuse and Duke at home towards the end of the season. Those should be wins for the Hokies. Now it, it I, doesn't feel that way. They're this close. Yeah, like, they, they're they this close. And we all picked. Well, I'll, I'll tell you later who we picked in the preview. <laughs> but uh, um, I think Dino had a tough start to Syracuse because I think the way recruiting evolved over the, over the years really hurt programs like Syracuse and Boston College. You know, if you recall, before the last few years. You could not take official visits until your senior year started if you were a high school recruit, so like September. So everybody was like taking, but everybody was committing before they could take official visits. They were committing over the summer. Uh, and the, generally they would unofficially visit uh, recruits within driving distance and, and commit to those schools and they just wouldn't take official visits, or at least not that many of them. Uh, so. But Syracuse and to, you know even Boston College, they're so far up there in the middle of nowhere, and you got all these recruits from Florida and more southern states, and yeah. and it's tough to ask those kids to pay for <laughs> flights to Syracuse for themselves, right? So the, all these kids are already committing elsewhere to closer yeah. schools, and by the time Syracuse is actually able to bring them up on official visits in September, they've already committed elsewhere, right? And then the recruiting rules changed. And you could start doing official visits uh, in the spring and summer. And I think that helps Syracuse a lot, that they were able, actually able to get kids on campus before they made their verbal commitments. And I think that's helped them. Um, I, I would even argue that like Syracuse is one of those schools where uh, maybe a COVID year of recruiting, I won't say help, but it hurt them less than some other schools because it is a difficult place to get to way up there. Uh, but you, but you, know, you don't really realize it unless you take the visit it, itself. Um, so I, I think you, the reason you see so many freshmen in the 2D pier and in the starting lineup for Syracuse is because Dino's recruiting has improved ever since those new recruiting rules came into place. Um, that's why I would actually be an advocate of giving him another year uh, if I were a Syracuse fan because I think he has better players now because – Ever since the recruiting rules changed, he's had access to be able to recruit better players. The young guys have produced more than the older guys. I mean, the young guys have come in and replaced the older guys. And it, yeah. they've recruited the secondary spots, cornerback and safety, so well. Um, it all started the year we won 10 games in 2018. Andre Sisco was a freshman, led the nation in interceptions. And that year you also had Trill Williams and Afatu Melifanwu. Those three were freshmen. Now all three of them just got picked up this year to play in the NFL. 
And now they bring in a guy like Deuce Chestnut, who's a four-star, which Syracuse hasn't had a four-star DP, D-back, excuse me, DB since the 90s. Um, Tommy DeVito was the first four-star at all that Syracuse has brought in in a real long time. So they're just recruiting that spot really well. And then they're recruiting the linebacker spot so well. Michael Jones, a guy coming from IMG Academy down in Florida, mm. a very you know, prominent prep school, and he's played yeah. really well. Right, and, and I bet he's at Syracuse because – he was actually able to take an official visit there, yeah. you know, before his senior season started. Right. You know, he's so he's a guy who might not be there under the old rules. Yeah. Because he would have committed before he had a chance to to visit Syracuse. Because it's it's really tough for these kids to, to you know, pay for flight from Florida all the way up to to Syracuse. So uh, I think the timetable certainly hurts. And I think uh, Jones, what's he got, sixty some tackles so far so far this year. Yeah. He's a leading tackler on the defense, right? So yeah, I think Syracuse is in a better position now because of the of the new recruiting rules. And you could say the same thing for Boston College. Like Will Healy's getting a lot of credit for turning their uh, recruiting. Or, uh, did I say Will Healy? Will Healy at Charlotte. Yes, uh, I mean uh, ha- Jeff Haftley. Haftley, yeah, at, at, at Boston College. Um, I think uh, this, he's benefited from the same thing. He got there basically when the rule changes came about. So while yes, he's upgraded their recruiting. He got helped by changed rules basically as soon as he took the job. Well, and Dino Babers, there was just so much optimism about the program three or four years ago. They're not that far removed from beating Clemson in the Carrier Dome, Mm -hmm. almost beating Clemson in Clemson, I believe, the next year after that. Yeah, Um, uh, we literally – sorry, excuse me, can't say we. Syracuse (laughs) led the entire way uh, until Clemson took the lead with like four minutes left. Chase Bryce. Yeah, that was a Chase Bryce game. He is now who – Actually transferred to where did he transfer to first? Duke. He, he, he transferred to Duke. Duke. And then You're State. right, and then he's at App State, 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 State now. And Miami's very fortunate to have won that game. If he if he could actually throw the ball a little more accurately down the field, then Miami would be sitting on zero wins against FBS teams so far this year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Only one would be against Central Connecticut State. App State actually in action tonight playing Coastal Carolina. Ooh. Uh, get a little Wednesday night football going on. Is that the two? Well, kind of. I, I would say, uh, let's see, everybody thought North Carolina would be the best team in the state of North Carolina <laughs> this year. They could be. Uh, I would say the UNC is probably now like the fifth best team in the state of North Carolina this year instead of the tenth best team in the country. They're better than Duke. They are better than Duke. <laughs> That's not hard. <laughs> uh, well, for Syracuse, I mentioned like high expectations after beating Clemson. They had a 10-win season, I want to say. That was the year they lost, and that was Clemson was one of their only losses. Yeah. Right. So uh, Syracuse had a lot of high expectations, then kind of d- just struggled the last few years, put him on the hot seat. But th- this is a Syracuse team that is only five years removed from beating Virginia Tech in the Carrier Dome. Good news is Hokies 6-2 and two against the Orange in Lane Stadium, but th- this is a solid team. I mean, when's the ahead, last Chris. time? I, when's, I think the last time they played Syracuse in Lane Stadium, I was a junior in college. And D'Angelo Hall, 2003. Yeah. D'Angelo Hall returned two punts for touchdowns in the first half, <laughs> maybe even the first quarter. It's been a long time. I wasn't man. even. I wasn't even. Or I guess I had just been born. I was You'd born in August. Born. Last exactly. day in August. Well, and that just see this. This guy doesn't remember the last time Virginia Tech beat Syracuse. No. Well, nope. it just shows you the <laughs> how the ACC scheduling has been so weird. Ridiculous. I mean, you barely ever see Louisville, Syracuse. I, I mean, even Wake Forest, the Hokies don't I, like, see very I'm often. convinced like Louisville will never play a game in Lane Stadium before there's another round of conference <laughs> expansion and we all get broken up, you know? But in Syracuse fans' eyes, I mean, like, this this is a rivalry game. Um, from the Big East days, like, the way my dad looks at it, you know, Syracuse's rivals in football have always been West Virginia playing mm-hmm. for the Schwarzwalder Trophy, playing against Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this is a big game uh, for Syracuse fans because of the battles back in the day and because Michael Vick almost yeah. chose Syracuse and that that's part of that <laughs> for Syracuse fans you know what could have been type of thing and McNabb and Virginia Tech going down to the wire in '98 in the dome right so those are all huge moments in the history of Syracuse football and Virginia mm-hmm. Tech's been a big part of that during the Big East days. Yeah, I mean I, I certainly believe that. I, it's it's kind of weird that like when Virginia Tech joined the ACC, it's almost like and Syracuse remained in the Big East and you know you were really worried about the future of their program and everything like that. And and I think the way recruiting changed, but like the rules did not change to accommodate the other parts of it, the Syracuse program itself kind of got left behind. But there was a time when these were two basically the same programs, yeah. the exact same programs. And they alternated wins during the whole McNabb era. I mean, Tech lost to McNabb twice in the carry dome, and he lost 
in Lane Stadium twice. Uh, so I, I think uh, obviously the fortunes of the programs, you know, went in op opposite directions there for a while, but right now they're back to pretty much even. I mean, I, I think if you've – I've watched Syracuse play this year twice against Florida State and Clemson, and I don't think – I don't think they should have lost to Florida State. I mean, I, I think you can honestly – I mean, the, the, that's the only game where uh, Syracuse hasn't stopped the run this year. The holding call, too. I right. mean, that that, of, oh, that was a bad call. That's right. It was yeah. a horrible call yeah. in the last drive of the game. So, uh, And you can't blame that stuff on refs, but, I mean, that was a it, blatant miss. It was a blatant, miss, was a blatant miss. It's one of those things you could see live and you didn't even need replay no. to tell it was a hold. Um, so, yeah, they are really close. I didn't see their game against Wake Forest, but I saw those other two games and uh, pretty impressed by how they play with so many young players. And uh, I would say they're, they're, the thing is, man, they're due to win. They don't look like an 0-4 football team to me, which was, no. which is what they would be if they lost to Virginia Tech this Saturday. And uh, the other thing, too, about that Wake Forest game is, like, they showed that they can score. And yeah. I haven't been super high on Wake Forest. I went down to Winston-Salem and watched them play Louisville, and, uh, you know, it, it took a effort, actually, basically a walk-off field goal to beat the Cardinals, and, uh, and then I watched them play Syracuse the next week. Uh, but Syracuse showed that they can score and keep up in that kind of situation. And I just don't know if Virginia Tech can keep up with scoring. Not that Syracuse has any kind of prolific offense passing the ball, but Virginia Tech struggles to score, and Syracuse I mean, has a pretty good defense. Yeah, know, so. I mean, if you score 24 or 27 against Virginia Tech, you're probably going to win the football. Right. <laughs> Let's face it. Well, and – you look at the Clemson game, Syracuse only scored 14 points, but that is Clemson's defense that they were facing against yeah, Wake Forest. Yeah, they put up, I want to say, 41, and then 30 against Florida State. So they, this is a team that can put up points. They did go to overtime, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but they that. only scored three of those three, points, in three points in overtime. So yeah. 30, 38 points in regulation right. against right. Wake Forest. Yeah. And the thing about Clemson, man, and I know their offense is struggling and they're outside the top 25 and everything like that. But their defense is still as, as good or better than ever. Yeah. They held Georgia to, well, three points, right? One, three one, points. The pick six the was pick the only six touchdown, was the only touchdown the of the game. So, yeah, they held this awesome, awesome Georgia team to three points. So this Clemson defense is still completely legit. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe Clemson did have more success shutting down Tucker than anybody else has. But nobody else has the personnel to use that exact same <laughs> – I mean, you can copy certain parts of it, but you're not going to be able to do it as well unless you have Clemson's players. Yeah, does the blue, does the blueprint to stop Sean Tucker include having half of your defense be five-star recruits? Right, right, things like that. And, and you know, it, it, you can't make excuses, but Syracuse also missed a 48-yard field goal that would have sent that to overtime, too. Yes. Which you know, is so. uh, con a little bit surprising considering that's the former Lou Groza yeah. winner. Yeah, that, that's the wild thing about him. He won it, and he just kind of has fallen off yeah. since. Uh, yeah, and I, and I saw him. He missed an extra point against Florida State, too. Yeah. He won it as a freshman, true right. freshman, he and sure he did. was, like, unconscious. He, in Death Valley against Clemson, a uh, crucial point in the game, drilled a 54-yarder mm. into the win, and then as the year he won it and just since has slowly kind of regressed. Uh, but that's a kick. You know, you can't blame Dino for making that decision. It was a fourth yeah. and one, and they were like, you know, you go for it. You're, you're not even promised to get much better field position. Everyone was like, give it to Tucker. You know, there's 45 seconds left. You have the Lou Groza award winner. You're kicking that field goal, yeah. you know, yeah. and he missed it. So. Well, this is, this is Andre Schmidt, not spelled the way you would assume. Nope. nope. S-Z-M-Y-T, Schmidt. Uh, yes, former Lou Groza award winner. And he's still a great kicker, so if this game comes down to a, a kick, Syracuse probably has the advantage there. We're going to take a break here for a second here on the Tech Sideline Podcast. First, we're going to throw it over to Katie, and when we come back, we're going to talk about kind of the meaning of this game and Hokie's offense trying to get back on track. But first, mm -hmm. let's send it over to Katie in the fourth chair. Gio mentioned this earlier. We can talk about recruiting nightmares all day long, but thankfully Michael Vick is not one of them, even though he almost <laughs> chose Syracuse back in the late 90s. Um, came down to Virginia Tech in Syracuse, took his official visit, Got was hosted by Donovan McNabb, and then I think it came down to Vic's mom saying, I want you to stay in the state of Virginia. So mm -hmm. thankfully he did. And then, of course, he played them in 1999, and Virginia Tech won 62 to nothing. So no remorse on his end, I would hope. Um, and then just looking at the connections between these two programs, I assume there wouldn't be any. Tech has no players from the state of uh, New York, but – Syracuse has three Virginia kids, which surprised mm -hmm. me. I was looking at these names, and I saw the name Jihad Carter, and I was like, why does this name sound so familiar? And the more that I thought about it, I was like, oh, yeah, he was committed to us for a while. He was supposed to sign with that 2019 class with Tavion Robinson and J.N. Payute, another Richmond guy. 
I think he's gotten meaningful snaps this year, but I want to say he got hurt in the Clemson game. So. He's in the two deep. Yeah. He is. So Listed we won't as an see or him. Boundary, sa- boundary safety. Okay. I think it was a leg injury or something of that nature. So we won't see him on Saturday. Won't see Anwar Spare or Umari Hatcher, I don't think either. So I think North Carolina is one of those only games that we really saw Virginia kids on another school make meaningful impacts against us. But the coolest thing I noted that or was – Sean Tucker and Peter Moore are high school teammates. So they'll play against each other this weekend, wow, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, both from Calvert Hall in Maryland. Okay. Okay. So does Tucker return punts? Is- no. Okay. No. Uh, he hasn't at all. Pena returns punts, and uh, he had a huge play against Clemson, too. He doesn't get in at wide receiver much. They kind of gave him a shot. And I'll say I think Syracuse got a little lucky on the play. Schrader just kind of took a shot, chucked it up, and – Got, Pena got ahead of the coverage and uh, was able to make a catch and then make a guy miss and get to the end zone. Uh, but Pena is the one that returns the punts. And he's small, but he's quick. So he can be dangerous, not as dangerous as Tavion Robinson. He's, a, no way. he's another freshman, too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe well, a, a, a COVID, COVID freshman. freshman yeah. right. Maybe Peter Moore has the blueprint for how to stop Sean Tucker. Uh, I think the Hokies coaching staff may be asking for some tips there. <laughs> Let's hope he does. And then just one more note. Fuentes 2-2 two and two after back-to-back losses. I was hoping that, you know, Chris mentioned it earlier, we might have three back, back-to-back-to-back back losses in Lane Stadium, and I was hoping it had been a while since that happened. But last year it happened against Liberty, against Miami, and then against Clemson. Those were all in Lane Stadium yeah. and didn't get a win in any of them. So we'll see if he goes above 500 this weekend. But, yeah, yeah. that's all fun. What would be interesting is to know the last time Tech lost three straight home games in a non-COVID year. With fans in attendance. Right, with fans in attendance. And I'm racking my brain. I know they lost three games at one point in like 2002, but one of those was in the Carrier Dome. So I bet – Well, in 2018, Tech lost four straight games. Four straight games, and and, and I'm trying – one of those games was at Pitt, I remember. Yes. Uh, uh, And I I don't remember where uh, – well, I know we lost – Tech lost to Miami at home during that stretch. I, lo- I know they lost to Georgia Tech at home during that stretch. Um, was Notre Dame at home during that stretch too? Or that was during that stretch or before? Oh, that BC was a, that at was home was also in that one. So right. three so of the four were at home. Were at home. I just don't know if, don't they, know were if they were three in consecutive. Order. Yes. Right. I, I don't think they were. I think Pitt. I think Pitt was in the middle, and yeah. I think Miami may have been the last one. Yeah. I, I, my guess is that you have to go back to before the bowl streak began, so nineteen ninety two or before would be the last time Tech lost three consecutive home games in a non-COVID year with yes, fans in the crowd. Fans. That's wow. my guess. I'm pretty used to seeing Syracuse football lose three home games in a row uh, <laughs> without without question. But one thing that, you know, um, kind of scares me a little bit coming from the Tech side um, is, you know, I hope the atmosphere is at least something, you know. Um, so many Syracuse fans, it, Dino Baber talked about it in his press conference, he's never been to Lane Stadium. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a glory place for college football. I mean – And, you know, my whole family, I got 16 people coming from Syracuse to come see this game. And, uh, you know, people back home, um, I you know, just being on other shows and stuff with Syracuse fans that do shows kind of similar to your guys, um, you know, they're coming up for the game. And everyone wants to see Lane Stadium. Syracuse hasn't played here since then. And I hate to break it to people. I'm like, guys, like Virginia Tech just lost to Pitt last week. People aren't happy. Students left at halftime. It's a new Um, game. You know, I'm well, a little, yeah. I'm a little nervous. The atmosphere won't be there. Me too. You no, know, I, I didn't think it was going to be as good as it was against Pitt either. Now they left at halftime at Pitt, but for the right. but for the first half, you know, the student section was full. Yeah, everything like that. So it was better than I thought it would be. But I, I do have concerns as well this week. Yeah. And sometimes people just like need a break. Yeah. Because Tech has played so many home games already to start the season, and you're just kind of worn out. It was really cool to hear Dino talk about, though, um, you know, how excited he is to come to Lane Stadium. It is a mecca of college football. And I just kind of sat there and I was like, wow, like I've literally gone to games at Maryland and UVA. But I, I like I lived at the Dome as a kid, season ticket holder. I went to like every game with my grandparents and stuff and um, coming to games at a place like this growing up. I mean, that was my dream to go see a college football game at a sold out place. And I've known what Enter Sandman is since I was like eight you know right. watching virginia tech football on tv and like i've always wanted to go to a game there and you know i sat back in my dorm like holy cow like i go to school here and i went to two sellout games this year like you know that's wild um so just it's special man going to games at lane stadium is special coming from somebody as much as i love going to games at the dome um you know you guys are used to this but it's a special <laughs> place to go see a football game it's the best atmosphere in college football 
Well, I don't think the atmosphere is going to be quite like Carolina or Notre Dame on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe better than Middle Tennessee and Richmond. We're going to have to see. We're going to talk about the game a little bit more on the other side. Also talk about the ramifications of a win and a loss and see where the Hokies can go from here for the rest of the season. But first, we're going to take a break here on episode 201 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tech Sideline podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. We are previewing Virginia Tech's matchup with Syracuse this weekend. Hokies trying to bounce back after a couple of tough losses to Notre Dame and Pittsburgh before heading on the road for four of their final five games. Jake Lyman, Chris Coleman, Katie Adams, Malcolm Stewart, and our newcomer filling in for Will Stewart today, Giovanni Heater, a Syracuse native who's given us a lot of good insight on the Orange program and what the Hokies can expect to see on Saturday We've talked a lot about the offense and the threat that Sean Tucker brings for the Orange, but their defense has been surprisingly very good this season. We talked about all the freshmen they have playing, and they're holding opposing offenses to 3.1 yards per carry. They've been keeping games close. It's going to be a tough matchup for this Hokies offense. 3.1 yards per carry uh, against Virginia Tech's running game does not sound promising on paper. Um, actually, you know, they got a lot of young, talented players on defense. We've talked about Deuce Chestnut, and the first time I'd ever heard of him was when I was watching the uh, the Florida State game, and he intercepted, I'll just use the generic term, flanker screen. He intercepted a flanker screen, and just amazed that he just jumped it and picked it. It was an incredible play. Horrible blocking job by Florida State, but that's Florida State, <laughs> so you would expect that. Um, anyway, a really, really good freshman, but their best player on defense is a senior in my opinion, uh, Cody Roscoe, mm-hmm. defensive lineman, leads the ACC in tackles for loss with ten and a half, and I think he's got seven, seven and a half sacks, something like that too. So, yeah, this is a – it's a good group. Like, it's not a dominant defense, but it's solid. It's solid. It's, it's not Notre Dame level good. Um, it's probably uh, West Virginia good. It's uh, maybe not Pitt good, but, but close. But somewhat close. Uh, maybe probably not the matchup issues for Virginia Tech that yes. Pitt created. But just just the way Pitt plays defense, they put an extra guy in the box, and this and then just force you to beat their defensive backs one on one, which Tech's receivers can't do. Yeah. Uh, Syracuse doesn't play defense quite like that, so they're not as tough a matchup as Pitt. But still, I mean, for the hand he's been dealt this year, Dino Babers, I think with this group of mostly young players. I don't think you could really ask anymore if you're a Syracuse fan. Coming from a Virginia Tech standpoint of things, uh, I think like the most alarming thing about the Syracuse defense is their ability to put pressure on a quarterback, right? And Braxton doesn't really handle the pressure all that well, especially if he's forced to throw it. Um, against Liberty was probably their best defensive output. They sacked uh, Malik Willis six times in that mm. game, and they put really good pressure on DJ Uyunglele. Now, granted, that's a struggling offensive line for Clemson, uh, but I think their performance against Liberty was what was really impressive about the defense. But... Um, the biggest thing is depth, too, like especially in the secondary. I mean, Garrett Williams last year was kind of the deuce chestnut, and everybody said he was kind of that next Cisco, and he hasn't fallen off at all, but they just add a four-star guy like deuce chestnut. You know, um, he's the only guy to ever have a pick six against Trevor Lawrence in Trevor Lawrence's entire collegiate career. Right. Um, so he's a guy that's lethal in the secondary. They can put pressure. The linebackers are good. It's just there's not a gap in the defense. Like you said, they're not glaringly extremely impressive. They're not the best defense in the ACC, but they don't really have any holes. There's not really a spot that you can exploit. There's no obvious weak spot. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you would think like with seven games now on film of all these freshmen, you'd be able to come up with something. Yeah. But but you know, you haven't quite seen that. I mean, you do. I mean, you saw Wake Forest. You know, have success against them, but Wake Forest has a really, really good offense. Uh, Virginia Tech does not. So, even it is a bunch of freshmen, and ideally, I would like to think that this is when the old Cornelson misdirection stuff comes back out somehow, which can be confusing to young defensive players, and we hadn't seen that much stuff, uh, you know, this year. The, the 2019 type stuff. Uh, maybe that. Maybe without. 
uh, Dalton Keene, and without James Mitchell, it becomes more difficult to to run that type of an offense. The three three five too is kind of what makes this Syracuse yeah. defense tough to play against because it's unique. It's something that a lot of teams don't see. So for people that don't understand that, the three three five, you're gonna have three uh, pass rushers on the defensive line, three linebackers, and then uh, five defensive backs out there. So you're adding that rover spot. You're adding that extra athletic body, and it just allows you to do more in the defense. They get fancy with some different blitz packages um they get fancy in their coverage but they're still able to create pressure with just three guys or blitzing their linebackers and they like to blitz the safeties as well um so it's just an interesting defense that is unique compared to a lot of schools in the acc and and they're fun to watch because they fly around and they make athletic plays yeah and you know you can you can always walk up one of these 235 pound linebackers as a defensive end or your 215 pound rover as a linebacker and create multiple fronts and uh i think it's easier to disguise your coverage and your intent in a defense like this and uh i remember like way back in the day when west virginia first started running like a 335 stack defense with when they stacked their linebackers directly behind the three defensive linemen and you couldn't you didn't know which gap each of the guys were, were going to go to and uh that that really confused offenses back then and uh, uh generally speaking like i i Back in the day, I wasn't a huge fan of the three three five, but it's grown on me because I think it's not. You can't really consider it a straight up three three five anymore because it, it could morph into four or five man fronts, to, you know, depending on where guys line up. Line up. Well, and I think the key is it's not going to be an easy defense for Brad Cornelson in this offense to go against this weekend. I don't weekend. think any defense is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to say is no, it's. It's no picnic in right. this final game Certainly of the home not. stretch before heading on the road. So not going to be easy. If the Hokies can't get it going against Syracuse, do you think this offense ever comes around, especially playing some tougher opponents down the stretch away from home? Well, they'll cer- certainly play more experienced defenses than the ones they'll face this year. So you, on paper, you would sit here and say, all right, now let's just the two deep at cornerback for Syracuse. Redshirt freshman, redshirt freshman, true freshman, redshirt freshman. If Virginia Tech's receivers can't get any separation this week and and they can't find any spots down the field to, to work some big gains, then who can they do it against, right? Yes. And now I'll be honest, I have not studied Georgia Tech yet um, or, or any of those other teams. Uh, Virginia does not have a good defense unless they're playing Duke, apparently. Um, <laughs> so, but, but, you know, you just it's not so much about who's left on the schedule. It's about like what, what you've seen so far. Like that Tech hasn't gained 400 yards in a game this year. Yeah, they, they couldn't score against Richmond. The spot I see Tech struggling too is, and, and I mean they've struggled all year in it is in the running game. I mean Syracuse's linebackers are pretty darn good. Yeah, they're young, but Stephon Thompson, Michael Jones, uh, Onwer Sparrow doesn't play as much, but Marlo Wax and Jeff Canton are coup. I mean, those guys, it's not just Michael Jones out there is what I'm trying to get at. Stephon Thompson, Marlo Wax, and Jeff Canton are coup. All three of those guys are like really, really strong linebackers. Something Syracuse hasn't had in a long time is a really, really strong linebacking core. Um, I just think Virginia Tech struggles to run the ball. And then and then you, you're you trying to make Burmeister, um, obviously Virginia Tech's going to do what Notre Dame did, try and make Burmeister throw 20, 30 yards, very similar to what Virginia Tech should try and make Garrett Schrader do. Um, they kind of mirror each other in that way. But when then you get there and then you have the secondary, it's just like, it's so hard to find spots where I see Virginia Tech having success, and you know, I want Virginia Tech to have you know success in this one, um, and I want them to compete in the Coastal, though it, it seems like after last week that's kind of a far cry at this point. Um, it's just it's so hard to find the spots where they will. Well, know? here's where Virginia Tech has a possibility to have success. Uh, when The one game where Florida State struggled to stop the run this year was against Florida State, and it was all the quarterback running. Uh, right. they, they could not contain a mobile quarterback. That's yeah. Very true. Um, so, and that, and Burmeister, if he's anything, that dude is dynamic in the open field. So, uh, that's a that's a spot where I mean, I would look, spread them out, try to create seams in the defense and more space for for Braxton Burmeister. And uh, I think that's Virginia Tech's best bet to keep the chains moving against Syracuse. But if you're gonna do it, you got to do it like Florida State did it because on the flip side of that, against Liberty, Willis is a very mobile quarterback, and they That's did true. shut him down mm-hmm. and had six sacks on him. And really, he had his worst game of the season against Syracuse, and right. they shut him down. Right. Um. So if you're gonna do it, I mean, you gotta. There's a certain way to do it. Burmeister, though, 
He is the fastest quarterback in the ACC. He's, like uh, Fuente said, the best athlete, I think, besides maybe Trey Turner. I mean, those two are a toss-up um, on the team. Um, so he's quick. He, he can make anybody miss, but – um, in comparison to Schrader, like I said earlier, it takes one guy to take him down, not a couple. That's you know? true. You know, yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you get a hand on him with one guy and you do get a hold of him, he's not going to get away. Yeah, Virginia Tech is going to have to sh- uh, swarm Schrader mm-hmm. for sure because he's such a big guy. Yeah. Well, and I mentioned off the top of the second half, 3.1 yards per carry this season for Syracuse. Hokies in every game but Middle Tennessee have rushed for less than 3.6 yards per carry. So, That's what I'm saying on paper. It, it just doesn't seem – like a great matchup. Well, and you did mention the secondary is young. I mean, you listed through the cornerbacks. You even look at the safeties. Eric Coley's a redshirt junior, but besides that, true freshman, true freshman, true freshman, sophomore, redshirt freshman. If the Hokies' senior wide receiver, Trey Turner, and Tavion Robinson, who's been here for three years now, if they can't get going against this secondary, it feels like they may never. If, if, if they can't figure out ways to – get some running room for the receivers, uh, whether that's by just straight up beating guys off the ball or by coming up with creative ways to get them fo- get them the football, running guys in motion and, and creating looks for the Syracuse defense that Tech hasn't shown on film through the first seven games. Because it can be difficult for young players to adjust to things in-game that they haven't seen on film before. So I think that's important maybe for Virginia Tech that this week to break out some things like that that they haven't shown this year and to confuse some of the younger Syracuse players. Um, but yeah, you, you got to think that if, if they don't do it against this bunch of freshmen this week, then uh, whatever confidence is left from the fan base in this coaching staff is, is probably going to be gone because I think Syracuse is a talented young football team and Dino Babers has done a good job with this group, but you know, your average fan who, just goes to work every day and, and they're a fan on Saturdays and they don't, they don't pay a lot of attention on, on Saturdays uh, or on, during the week. Um, they're just going to look and see, oh, Syracuse, they're 0-3 in the ACC. They stink, yeah. right? Yeah. Their, their record says they stink, so Virginia Tech should win the football game. So if Virginia Tech doesn't, then – Whatever noises you heard after the pit game is just going to get louder this week. The one thing that I think is a positive for Virginia Tech when you look at offense going against the Syracuse defense is Syracuse's defense is very bend, don't break. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if Virginia Tech can methodically move their way down the field and not try and push that big play, because that's when Syracuse is going to make the big play. If Burmeister tries to chuck the ball on a 45-yard you know, go route, and Trey Turner doesn't get that step, that's when Syracuse can make their plays, right? Right. Um, But they're very bend, don't break. So they're going to give up those five-yarders, ten-yarders. And Syracuse isn't very good on those slants across the middle either. That's kind of where they start to fall apart. Well, it's it's good for Syracuse because Virginia Tech doesn't (laughs) run those plays. That's true. That's that's true. (laughs) But the the one thing, maybe you could say the one thing the Syracuse defense does struggle with is they don't force turnovers. Right. Uh, they, um, I think they've only forced what three or four on the season, and two of two of them were interceptions by Chestnut. So they're not they're not a defense that's been able to come up with with big game changing plays. So uh, you hold on to the ball against them. Like, like I don't think I don't think Syracuse is going to be able to go out there and put up like thirty or thirty five points no. on, on on Virginia Tech. No. Um, so if you don't turn the ball over, you're going to be in the game, which is surprising because. Syracuse has been so known for the last handful of years, especially in the Dino Babers era, for being a team that you know prides themselves on creating turnovers and getting especially interceptions. And it hasn't been there this year. Um, not that they aren't good. They just haven't created the turnovers. So do, that's, that's a great point. Do they have a turnover prop? They don't, they don't. Which, which I'm I'm glad they don't. My, <laughs> no, I think it's no chain. Yeah. Total no chain. tangent on that, but I think it was really cool for Miami because they were the first to do it, and it's so like Miami culture, that kind of um, yeah. just how Miami is. But everybody that copied it after, I'm like, really? It's horrible, yeah. and, I, and I think you – you better be winning football games if you break one of those things. Yeah, true. I think at this point, if you're going to do it, it has to be something super creative or tie into your school or your team. You you can't just pull out another necklace and copy Miami at this point. No, not at all. Right. All right, well, now we've looked kind of at both sides of Syracuse, where they're strong, where they're weak. I want to look big picture at this game. Mm -hmm. The Hokies, after the Notre Dame game, you could say, well – nine points away, one red zone score against West Virginia, and you don't blow the lead in the final four minutes. You're 5-0 and with wins over North Carolina, West Virginia, and Notre Dame. 
But then Pitt comes in and kind of embarrasses you on your own field. Crowd clears out. If the Hokies lose to Syracuse this weekend, is there any way to keep this season from spiraling the rest of the way? Mm, probably not. Um, I think and I, th- I think the conversation changes from the rest of the season to after the season or the future of the program. Yeah. And it's already tilted that way a lot, quite a bit. I mean, we just spent yeah. half of this podcast on Monday uh, talking about the coaching staff situation and things like that. Um, but, yeah, if, if Tech comes out against Syracuse and loses to – an 0 and 3 team in the ACC then i just uh I, I think people are just going to wash their hands of it and move on and and i don't think they're going to be thinking about the rest of the season i don't I, you right now we're still seeing questions like well if we do this and we do that <laughs> how can we play in the last 6 games or whatever i think if tech loses at home to syracuse i think people are going to look at those last 5 games then they're like whatever what are we going to do in december tell me that Looking at it from a Syracuse standpoint, this is the time of the year where Syracuse fans say, well, basketball season's right around the corner, <laughs> and at least we're good at that, right? So That's what our fans are starting I think starting Tech to fans say. are right. starting to get into that trend. <laughs> right, and, you know, on your point, I almost feel like it's already gone at, like that. As far as from a student standpoint, I mean, Jake, me, you, and Katie are students, right? Um, I'm worried to see if the student section is going to be completely packed like it has been all season long at the start of the game for Enter Sandman. I sure hope so, but I feel like after last week, the student body, and that's different from the rest of the fans, but I feel like they've almost given up a little bit at this point, and I feel like the, the fan base is right there. Um, I mean, literally walking out of the stadium, people were chanting Fire Fuente. And they had church, right? Yeah. Some people had church. Granted, last week at <laughs> Syracuse, at, at church, some students had church, I heard, that said Fire Fuente. Yeah. That's wow. Wild. Yeah. But well, so, walking out of the dome, the Syracuse students were doing the same thing and saying Fire Dino. Right. So. Well, and that, and that's that's something that, like, once you get to that point, like, you don't want a visiting recruit to see that. No. Right? No. I think... I think Fuente's seat is so much hotter than Dino's I agree. at this point. I agree. I mean, yeah. like, his seat is boiling. Like, and, like, like, you know. I, like, I can look at their depth chart and see how and see how many of their key players are so young. And, and if you sit down with Dino, I can guarantee you he would bring up those points about recruiting that I did earlier. And and it seems it just seems like things are trending better for Syracuse, even though their record is zero and three. It just it could easily be three and zero, right? And I know you are you are who your record says you are, but but it just seems like with this many young players on the on the roster, if you retain most of them, you've got more of an argument if you're Dino to bring me back next year. I've said it all week. At this point in the season, right now, it just kind of has felt like because I've watched every single game for both of these teams all season long. It just feels like Virginia Tech is kind of going like this and going downward trajectory just at where we are in the season. And Syracuse, despite losing games, is going like this. And the offense is improving for Syracuse. And week to week, they are getting better. Mm -hmm. Where Virginia Tech week to week, it feels like is getting worse. There's a complete lack of confidence in the Virginia Tech offensive players right now. And how could you you be confident if you're a Virginia Tech offensive player right now? There's just no evidence... And and I've this is I've been hearing this you know more and more from people who know some players and and that's the thing the players they don't have confidence in their offensive leadership and when when you go out there on a football field with no confidence in what you're doing and that you, and that you're going to get put in the right position to succeed it is human nature to you lose some of your quality practice habits you check out mentally a little earlier than you would in most games you don't maybe don't respond as well to adversity. Uh, you don't play quite as hard as you would otherwise. So uh, I, I think that's the major issue with the Virginia Tech offense is, is they've lost confidence in, in their leadership. And I don't think it doesn't look like the Syracuse players, to me, having watched them play a couple times this year, and I agree with you that they seem to be getting better. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a big one for, for Virginia Tech. And uh, I think if Virginia Tech actually does go out and have a good, decent offensive performance on Saturday, that'll be a sign that Fuente did some things behind the scenes during the week that he might never yes. admit to in a, in a press conference because I don't think he would ever throw Cornelson under the bus like that. Right. But I think if Virginia Tech does have a productive performance on Saturday, it's probably because – he retook a lot of control over the offense and said, you know what, I'm not doing the scout team stuff anymore. That's not what head coaches should be doing. <laughs> right. um, I think he it would be a sign that he went back and took more of a hands-on role with the regular offense. 
um, to try to jump jumpstart those guys a little bit. We'll see. And I'm not saying in any way that Fuente has lost his locker room, but I think you're right. Cornelson has uh, lost the faith of the yeah, offense. I don't think Fuente himself has lost no. the locker room. Um, I, I think the, the the defensive players are clearly have confidence in Justin Hamilton. Yes. You know, you can hear it in the way they talk, and quite frankly, they're performing much better than, than their offensive counterparts. And look, it's not like – I'm not star, – star rankings are not everything. But Tech has two four-star receivers starting. Jaden Payute was a four-star receiver, and here we are halfway through his redshirt freshman year, and he still hasn't caught a pass despite all the preseason mm-hmm. hype. Braxton Burmeister was a four-star. Four star. Keyshawn King was a four-star. He was averaging 1.7 yards per carry. Um, too small. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, James Mitchell was a four star, and yes, Tech lost him. But do you really think we'd be that much better, you know, with an extra tight end? So it's not like Tech didn't win any recruiting battles. No, right. They, I mean, it's it's an offense that's star studded with good recruits that just hasn't produced. And I think making this comparison between Syracuse's situation, Virginia Tech situation, or even Virginia Tech football and Virginia Tech men's basketball as a head coach outside of a few programs who are have already arrived and are at the top yeah. you're selling hope as a as a head coach and Virginia Tech men's basketball a lot of hope Syracuse looking at these young players a lot of hope it just seems like there's not much hope for anything in the future or p- current players at this point for Virginia Tech I mean they're gonna have to get it turned around starting this week starting this week because if you if you lose to Owen three Syracuse at home then like we can sit around and say, yeah, but this and this and that all you want. The fact of the matter is you just lost to 0-3 Syracuse. Yes. And that's – you are what your record says you are. And at that point, I th- it would be very, very difficult for anybody to regain confidence in anything in the football program, except for maybe Justin Hamilton and his defense, yes. which I think on the whole have done a pretty good job. And that and that's why Dino's not on the hot seat, right? I mean, it doesn't get any worse than Syracuse's 1-10 in 10 season last year, right? And somehow he's still instilled hope. Coming into this season, especially after week one, watching Syracuse put up an okay performance again against Ohio. I mean, the offense, that was Tommy DeVito playing, so it's completely different now. Was not impressive. Defense looked good. They didn't allow a single touchdown, but it's Ohio. And, and then I watched Virginia Tech beat North Carolina. I mean, I thought Virginia right. Tech was going to win the Coastal, and I thought Syracuse <laughs> was going to be dead last in the ACC. And, and my mind's completely changed. And the next week, Syracuse loses to Rutgers, and you're even more convinced, right? And the other thing, too, about that, though, you wish as a Syracuse fan that they would have done this Schrader thing sooner. Oh, yeah. Because there's no way – that Syracuse would have lost to Rutgers if they were playing the way they're playing now. And not even the way they're playing now, just the way they run the offense now. It's completely different, and Schrader is just just makes them so much better, so much different, so much more deadly, so much more two-dimensional than one-dimensional. Um, you, you wish you started the season with Garrett Schrader because you almost feel like you wasted three games with Tommy DeVito. Right. Well, and for Syracuse, definitely a very different-looking team than I think a lot of Hokies fans expected when they saw Syracuse on the schedule this season. Let's get into game picks. We're going to skip keys to the game this week because I think the key to the game is score points. I think that's, uh, yeah. that's I mean, pretty I, much I the key to the game. Yeah. Yeah. Put points on the board. <laughs> so I want to look at the game picks. Again, the preview for this week's game already up on TechSideline.com. Chris wrote it, and then... The picks for Chris, Will, and David are all at the bottom. Chris, I'll have you start. I think I picked it 23-21 to 21 Syracuse. And okay. it's a couple of reasons for that. First and foremost, like I see Sy- Syracuse as a definite strength on offense, their running game. And that matches up really well, or really bad from a Virginia Tech perspective, matches up really poorly with Virginia Tech's inability to stop the run. So Syracuse has a definite strength they can go to, and you can identify a definite weakness in the Virginia Tech yeah. defense. You flip it around, and you can't really do that. Like, there's no strength in the Virginia Tech offense. They can't run it. They can't pass it. The quarterback is injured, right? Yeah. And there's no backup. So it just doesn't seem like Syracuse really has an attackable point on defense from what we've seen out of the Virginia Tech offense this year. Um I, I do think Burmeister's legs will keep Virginia Tech in the game. Um, I think Schmidt will kick a late field goal to win the game for Syracuse. Uh, I think opposing kickers have made 18 of their last 19 kicks against Virginia Tech, including that that freaking Liberty guy last year who missed one that would have beaten Syracuse. Yep, and uh, he I think is he's only 
I think he's only been good from like 55% of his kicks from his career. He's one of four this year. He's terrible. He's a terrible kicker, but he made, he made the one the against one, Virginia yeah, Tech. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> always, and, and then so everybody always makes kicks against Virginia Tech is what it seems like. It seems like. So, so and now, yeah, no, now, no. now since uh, Schmidt missed his last week, he's due. Right. Yes, he yeah. missed a game winner last he, he, week. He missed it. He a tying one. He missed yeah. it against Clemson. All right, and UVA, you know, they could have had two more losses. Yes. Right. Right. So everybody else is missing field goals against other teams, but they're going to make them against Virginia Tech. So right. I think that's kind of where we are right now. <laughs> well, um, and so those are my that's my reasoning. So twenty three twenty one for Chris. Will has Syracuse twenty seven to twenty. His reasoning. He says he's going to the team that runs the ball a lot better, and hmm. that is clearly Syracuse right. with. With Sean Tucker in the backfield, David Cunningham in the room right now, uh, yep. listening in on the podcast. Uh, I've seen his his take <laughs> get a, a little bit of criticism. Uh, he's going Syracuse twenty eight, Virginia Tech hey, ten. Hey, hey. Everybody criticizing David. Now remember, he's a game ahead of Will and I this year. He is. He's in, in the predictions, and he picked the margin of victory last week in the pit game exactly. Wow. I was Mr. Optimistic. I only had Tech losing by eleven to Pitt. As DC did Will. picked it dead on. Um. So. Criticize David all you want to, but he's been on point so far with his picks. Yeah, yeah. He, David four and two. He missed North Carolina, missed West Virginia, but besides that, he has been perfect. Pick Notre Dame. Um, the fans also were right last week. They had pit by eleven plus at a whopping sixty four percent of the vote. Wow. Uh, this week, looking at the early uh, the early polling data here, six hundred and sixty seven voters. 36% have Syracuse winning one by 1 to 10. Uh, next up, Hokies by 1 to 10, and then after that, Syracuse by 11. Okay, so it used to be no matter what, Tech fans would roll into our polls and be like, oh, yeah, Tech's going to win. Tech's going to win. Even even if, even if like Will and I would pick the other team, be like, oh, Tech's going to win. And now they've actually turned. Now it's like, yep, I'm just going to pick the other team. Well, last week it was 78% of voters thought Pitt was going to win in some way or fashion. This week, only 60% are picking Syracuse, 40% picking Virginia Tech. But again, this is early. Last week, there were about 1,400 voters. We're about halfway there right now. So what do you that's got, a lot. Gio? Yeah, we got to go to Geo. We're going to put you in a tough spot here. You got to make somebody unhappy. Yeah, I know. it. Um, and I'm, I'm putting fandom really completely aside and um, fan of both, of course. Um, but... Just to be like completely honest with it, last week, I, I you know I was telling my friends I said Pitt's gonna blow out Virginia Tech. Like the best part of last week, and I knew it going in. Just like you said, Chris, last week on the podcast, like the best time last week was gonna be the tailgate Absolutely. beforehand. And you it know, was. and you just knew it. <laughs> and um, I got Syracuse twenty four seventeen. Um, I just think that Virginia Tech can't do enough offensively. And I'm not saying Syracuse is going to have the greatest offensive outgoing because Virginia mm-hmm. Tech does have a good defense. But they're going to do enough in that run game. like Because of uh, Virginia Tech's poor performance on run defense, I think Sean Tucker is going to have another 150-yard game. I just do. I just sure. see it out I of him. You can yeah. see that. Yeah. You know, And uh, I think I mean, Schrader... He's going to run the football well. I don't think Syracuse is going to pass it well. I think Schrader's going to throw an interception or two um, without Jermaine Waller in there even. Um, I, I just see that happening too. I think Tech uh, hangs in there. I just don't see them doing enough offensively to win the game. And I think Syracuse, late touchdown uh, or a situation where Tech kind of makes a comeback, Syracuse is up. Because Syracuse can stall out sometimes. They get a little bit ahead, then they get a little too comfortable. Um, so I think a situation where maybe Tech's trying to come from behind and just can't quite close the gap. Uh, but my final pick, Syracuse 24, Virginia Tech 17. And that's fandom out the window. That's just looking at it with a critical eye. I've been watching football my whole life, and I just think that's I think Syracuse is the better team, and they're going upwards. Is anybody in this room, would anybody in this room pick Virginia Tech to win on Saturday? Well, we've got everybody on Syracuse right now. No, Malcolm. Malcolm's kind of Mal- wishy-washy. Malcolm's, right. Malcolm's on the line. Right. I'm not making a pick. I'm I'm actually perfect on picks this week. I was at I was in Nashville over the weekend, <laughs> and I I went to the Titans Bills game on Monday night. I texted uh-huh. a friend three hours before kickoff. Thirty four thirty one Titans book it, and that was the final score. Wow. No way. Oh. Yeah. So wow. uh, I'm feeling good about my picks. That's why I'm not going to pick now. I'm going to keep my my record untarnished for the week. Tough <laughs> loss for my Bills. Tough. <laughs> All right. Well. We got our game picks in. Now it's time to hear from some of the fans. Let's go over to the YouTube chat. Katie, what do we got in there today? There was a lot of really great questions, and then, of course, you guys answered the majority of them in the last five <laughs> minutes, one of them being, who needs this win more, Fuente or Babers? And I think the consensus is that it's Fuente. Fuente. 
as well as if Tech loses this game, do the wheels fall off for this team? And I think we would say yes. I think they might be crawling to the finish if they lose this game, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. No but here, I, can I, like, piggyback one? Yeah. Like, if Tech loses this game, and actually this is a good question for both teams because they're in a similar situation. Like, right now, who has the better chance to make a bowl game, Tech or Syracuse? Uh, yeah. Kind of the I have I have not looked at Syracuse's remaining schedule. Syracuse gets hard. They still got to play NC State. Oh, yeah. They still got to play. Um, but you've already played Wake and Clemson at that point, which are probably your two toughest in conference. Yeah. They still got to play Pitt. Syracuse yeah. plays Pitt every year, point, and they're right, playing right. at Heinz Field, I believe. Right. Um, Virginia Tech's schedule is much more favorable going forward than Syracuse's schedule. Mm-hmm. But Syracuse is playing better football right now, so right. It's, it's tough. On an off note, if you want to talk about hard schedules, UNC still has to play all three ranked ACC teams and Notre Dame. Good. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do play Wofford, so they might win one more game, but that's uh, something to look out for. Going couldn't. back to the questions, Sam Sweeney says, do you think our two deep as half empty do you think of our two deep as half empty or full of productive players that might be part of the problem, especially on offense? What are your thoughts? I, th- I think we have a severe player development problem on offense. Like I can't sit here and say that like Trey Turner lacks talent but when he was a freshman I thought he was going to be an all ACC player by the end of his career because he had a great freshman year and then he just stayed the exact same the rest of his career and uh, I, I just I, I look at Jalen Holston and he's been the same running back his whole career and uh, I look at at Gallo and he's been the same tight end his whole career and Burmeister, I know he's hurt, but has he actually gotten better since he stepped foot on campus? Did Hendon Hooker really get better when he stepped since he stepped foot on campus? Did Quincy Patterson really take huge strides when he was here? Uh, I just you just don't see you, you, Darisaw improved, but for the most part, you just you're just not seeing guys on the offensive side of the ball make big strides in player development. Even though a lot of them were four-star players coming out of high school, and I, I just think I think player development is the most important thing in college football. And you mentioned it that Herbert already came in groomed and ready to go. Right. You know? E- exactly right. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sometimes people say we're not talented enough. I don't know how talented we would be if we actually were good at player development. How talented would we look if – Trey Turner wasn't still like the same size as he was as a freshman. If he was 205 pounds now, if he had gained, you know, 20 pounds of muscle like most guys do from their freshman to senior year, and I'm not trying to knock on Trey because I'm not mad at any of the players. Um, but like, how, Kashawn King, why is he five pounds lighter in his third year than he was as a true freshman? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, just stuff you don't see at other programs. So I'm not going to sit here and say we don't have enough talent to be better than we are. I just don't think they're. I don't think our development, and I'm not just talking. When I'm talking about like how to teach guys how to run routes and things like that. I'm talking about 12 months out of the year, nutrition, strength and conditioning, getting guys to buy into programs like that, and disciplining them. Disciplining them when they don't. Uh, that's what this program lacks, and that's what's got to be fixed even more than like a new offensive coordinator or anything like that. It is painful to watch. Hennon Hooker be so good at Tennessee. And then look at and, and I, I like watching Braxton Burmeister play. I do. He's fast. He, he's explosive. But it's just like we had that. And right. or Virginia Tech had that. Quincy Patterson, same thing. It, it, and then the numbers he's putting up at Tennessee, it's like you didn't utilize a weapon at that point. I mean, this is like the fourth different set of players that people are blaming. Yes. Well, Same you, coaching staff. When you recruit four stars instead of five stars, because the five stars leave after three years, the four stars, you try and develop them so they are as good as the sophomore five stars when they're seniors, and it just doesn't seem like that development's been there. You know, Kenneth Walker the third at Michigan State is the number one rusher in the country this year. He began his career at Wake Forest. In fact, he played against Tech in Lane Stadium yeah. back in 2019. He was a two-star recruit and the number 112 player in the state of Tennessee coming out of high school. The number two rusher in the country is is Tucker from Syracuse, and I'm going to do an inside the numbers about this uh, tomorrow. But I think it's like like seven out of the top ten rushers in the country were guys who were three or two star recruits. You know, right. player development is the most important thing about college football. I don't know what got me down this this track. <laughs> what was the original question? Well, the, 
Go ahead. Katie. The original question was: Do you see our two deep as half empty or full of productive oh, players? Oh, that, oh, that that yeah, and that's <laughs> okay. I totally understand how I got down that stretch. Now, um, I would say mm, half full, maybe, but I still think like still think it's more player development than anything. Um, I mean, I, I look at a guy like Khalil Herbert, who now starts in the NFL. And nobody wanted him out of high school. You know, it was just Kansas develop, developed him. Kansas, right? And, and it wasn't last we, miles, Kansas. We've either. got 10 running backs on the roster, and what, what have we done with what, well, we, what has Tech done with it? Well, and especially at running back, you see it from high school to college and college to the NFL. It feels like every year there's an undrafted guy who turns yeah. out to be a top five right. rusher in the NFL. Right, right. So, you know, honestly, I have no v- – no strong opinion on like our talent level on offense. I'd like to see them coached and developed by somebody else. And then I think I'd be able to give a clearer answer on that. We'll end on this one. It's a fun one from Trey Amend over or under 50 K in the stadium this weekend Ooh. in the stadium or announced uh, <laughs> slightly above, I guess I'll say it enters Sandman. It's over by the end of the first quarter. That, that's under. fair. That's fair. Like I, you wonder how like how many students will come yeah. in to do their social media. I'm at enters Sandman. Thing, I, I'm at enters like, Sandman. You we'll know what? Day. Yeah. The, it's a noon. It's a noon kick too. That 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 like doesn't help. Um, it certainly doesn't. The three thirties and especially the night games. I mean, those are always just different. Um, for. I hope that it's packed because I have so many people from Syracuse that I've been sending them videos and telling them all year how awesome it is to come to football games here. So, Well, you know. the good news is this may be the last chance for Tech fans to come out to a game that won't be miserably cold this yeah, year. Yeah, it's going to be nice weather. I think like a high 65, six, yeah, somewhere in yeah, there. Yeah, it it yeah. keeps like going up. Like at one point it was 57. Now it's back up to like 62. Well, so it's, it's kind of fluctuating. That's fine around that's here yeah. this time of year. And like, but like – very little chance of rain, hardly any perfect, wind. Yes. So yeah, I think it's going like, to be like a perfect late yeah. October day. Yep. Only other home game on the schedule, Duke, ele- uh, November 13th, which, I mean, you never know with Blacksburg weather, you would assume. Would be I've worn chilling. shorts to a game on December 1st before, so you never <laughs> truly know. You never know. know. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Katie, and thank you to all the fans who dropped questions and comments today. I think that's going to wrap things up on episode 201 of Tech Sideline Podcast, previewing Syracuse. Previews already up on techsideline.com. What else is coming up before game time? I'll do that inside the numbers uh, article tomorrow. And I've already d- researched the the running backs part of it. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with the article, but I think it's going to be something, you know, player development related. Like you don't necessarily have to sign a bunch of four stars and five stars to have good football players, right? Yeah, it'll be interesting, especially we talked about Sean Tucker on this team, one of those examples, and then I, I know you posted on the boards about uh, Michigan uh, Walker yeah. uh, uh, at Michigan State leading the country in rushing. Uh, and then David, of course, who is still with us here in, in studio, he will have his recap after the game on Saturday. Kickoff at 1230. Uh, I do want to thank G- Giovanni Heater for making his debut on the podcast today. I'm yeah. sure we'll have you back. I can't uh, I can't thank you guys and Will enough. I mean this was uh this was a blast. Like I said, a little bit of a I watch every week, so a little dream come true and uh I was incredibly excited for this and just really grateful for the opportunity. So thank you guys. Well, Gio, bringing a lot of Syracuse expertise that we probably wouldn't have had had he not been on set. So a great job today. You can find him at Geo Heater on Twitter. I yes, that's correct. Yes. Uh, Chris Coleman to my left, lead analyst and columnist at TechSideline.com. Again, his preview of the Syracuse game already up on TechSideline.com. And you can find him at Chris Coleman TSL on Twitter. Katie Adams in our fourth chair today always does a great job with her midway segment and the questions at Katie6Adams on Twitter and Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes always doing a great job. I'm Jake Lyman signing off here on episode 201 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Enjoy the, the game, Hokies fans. Enjoy your weekend. and We'll talk to you on Monday.